Becky Preeby, um, as Mark introduced me. Um, I, uh, I've met Mark actually a couple years ago when I was working for a company called uh, um, Intuware. Um, and my background is kind of all over the place. So um, I've done a lot of work in a variety of different um, interaction um, experiences. So I worked on HoloLens 1. Uh, I worked on an infotainment system for the McLaren MP412C. I've done some work with Deutsche Telekom on interactive television. Um, I did a lot of work on NVIDIA Tegra prototype devices. And most recently, I worked on the Realware HMT1 and some collaborations with partners on that, and specifically um, with Cisco on integrating WebEx teams for the HMT1. So I kind of have a pretty diverse background. Um, I've been in experience design for about 15 years. And right now I work, My it seems that my, um, my uh, career is converging as technology <laughs> converges. So I work, uh, now I'm working with a couple AI companies and some still doing some XR work. Uh, one of the companies I'm working with is in Australia, and they're working on a industrial uh, assistant using artificial intelligence for um, industrial workers. It's primarily delivered on mobile devices right now, but they're working toward delivery on wearable devices. Uh, another company that I work with right now is doing uh, natural language, um, which is kind of a unique, they have a unique approach in that they're working on how to develop natural language interactions based on how the human brain processes language rather than using deep learning um, and machine learning traditional uh, configurations. So those are a couple things that I'm doing. Um, and as I go through this presentation, please feel free to stop me at any point and ask questions. I don't mind at all. Um, I'm going to what I'm going to do is kind of talk through some of the things that I'm going to give you some kind of recommendations of things that I've learned from my experience, I'm gonna talk through how we built the realware design system and kind of the idea behind design systems. I'm sure a lot of you are aware, but um, I'll just go through what, what we did strategically and what we learned from it. And hopefully it can help you, but please do interrupt if you feel, if you feel like you have a question that's relevant to what I'm talking about. So I always start every presentation I do with talking about these three books. Um, these are three of my favorite books, and the reason I really like them is because they kind of encompass what I think experience design is. So the first one is called The Inevitable by Kevin Kelly. He was one of the co-founders of Wired Magazine, and it's about um, just understanding technology and how it's shaping how we are as human beings and our world around us and how we interact with our world. And I think it's a super powerful book. It talks about um, kind of things that have happened in the past and things that are happening in the present and things that are going to happen in the future. And one of the key principles it talks about is that how in today's society, we're constantly upgrading um, and that basically that's going to be the future of humanity for the rest of humanity is just upgrades continuously, which is a really uh, important thing to think about when you think about design and human experience because it means that we're basically teaching people to learn. And it's one of the kind of primary principles in what we're, what we're offering people when we develop experiences, I think. And then the second one is The Design of Everyday Things and that's by Don Norman. And I think probably if you're a designer, you know who he is. It's a very powerful book about um, delivering best experiences across any design medium. And then the last one, Sapiens, and it's a, a book um, by a evolutionary scientist, and it's really good and anecdotal. It tells a lot of uh, powerful stories about why humans are the way they are and gives you really good insight into why we think the way we do and what drives our behavior. So I always recommend those three books. And then this is one of my favorite quotes by Don Norman. Um, it says, it is the duty of machines and those who design them to understand people it is not our duty to understand the arbitrary, meaningless dictates of machines. 
So it's basically, you know, saying that we need to think, we need to make humans think like machine, or make machines think like humans, not humans think like machines. So a lot of technology that comes out, it requires a human to learn how the machine operates, where we need to kind of start thinking the other way, where we need to make the machine learn how the human operates and then deliver technology and interactions that work in that manner. And then um, this is just uh, some high level about the significance of design systems. So if anybody on this call doesn't know what a design system is, just it's basically creating a language, a visual and interaction language that your interface is based on in order to give people the most value and the best experience. So um, Envision, I just recently got this quote from Envision that says a design system can help mitigate loss, increase inconsistency, increase consistencies and efficiencies and smooth out your company's operations. So what they're talking about loss is just the investment that you put into your product. So when you invest into a design system, you're investing in a baseline approach across everything. So you can't really lose by doing so. Hey, quick question. Um, this is Liz. Um, we are just starting to invest in Envision. And are you using it for 3D design at all? Nope. Um, okay. I, <laughs> I, I actually love it. Um, I use it quite a bit for mobile design, but yeah, I, have not, I am. Yeah, haven't used it. Um, I've been doing some prototyping in AR with uh, both an application called Torch. I don't know if you've mm. heard of that, but it's no, uh, it's kind of nice. Um, yeah, I can send you information about it if you if you want. Um, but it's their website is just torch.app. Okay. Yeah, it's Thanks. really it's really good, and they're a really good team, small team of people that are kind of building a. It's for AR prototyping. It's it's pretty powerful, and it works on iPhone and iPads. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So. Um, Basically, the benefits of, of design systems are, like the quote says, investment. Um, it, it, it gives you something like you, you don't have to keep building things over and over again. So when you design something, you design it once really well, and then you build on what you designed, and you build it systematically. And we really saw this at Realware in that um, you build a, when you build a system, you can produce apps really quickly so especially if you have a core system like our system uh the real world system is basically an operating system on top of uh um android which i'll explain a little bit more about later but it gave us a lot of power there you gain familiarity so that you get consistency across your applications that allows users to understand what's happening when they switch from one to the other or when they pick up a device um, after they've used it once and they pick it up again or in our case we leverage a lot of stuff in android so if you've used android it makes it feel like you've used the realware device um, and then the other things are just structure and, and scalability so if you have structure it's easy to scale Right. So I think we know that about pretty much anything. It's it's obvious in any design medium. So like architecture, whatever, if you build something with a good structure, you can add on to it pretty easily. So I hopefully you guys are all familiar with the rover device. So this is a, a, a image of it. Um, it's a wearable headset. It's a monocular display. Um, it's uh, designed primarily for industrial use. Um, there are some use cases that occur outside of industrial use. Uh, it works left or right eye. Um, it's all voice controlled. It works um, in high noise environments. Um, and it's just basically optimized for the industrial experience, which was a really powerful thing, I think, in design because anytime you design something, restrictions give you power. So if you're restricting your use case to a specific use, it allows you to target and optimize for that use. And so the challenges, I think 
the challenges were mainly around design integration and um, kind of just how it would work in, in the company internally. So the reason I came into Realware was to help them integrate design into the company. Um, and it was, that was probably the biggest time investment was to educate people about the power of design and why design is important and what is a design system and why would you want one and kind of that sort of thing and to help kind of understand what was happening in the company with processes. So what, how things were working, like what teams were doing what, how things were flowing between um, the requirements and the product and the engineering and that sort of thing and just kind of figuring out how to integrate the design process into the company. So that was probably the most significant challenge. Um, time to market. So um, Realware has a very small team and, or did at the time, probably bigger now because they just got a bunch of money. <laughs> but um, the the time to market is, uh, is very important. So when you design a design system, a lot of times you invest a significant amount of money and time in the system. And a lot of times in an organization, this seems will appear like it's taking a long time. And if you if teams aren't used to doing design um, or integrating design, this can be a big battle. So a lot of times it requires some education around that because I think Google I, I don't know exactly how much time they spent on on their design system, but it was years and many, many, many designers. Um, so I think that sometimes that can be a little bit of a of a education process, trying to teach people how and the importance of getting it right the first time and that you gain that back when you once you have it. So that allows you to work much more rapidly once you have it. Um, and then I think that just having a small team is sometimes a bit tricky when you're doing a design system. So for me, when I was at Realware, um, there were primarily two designers on the team and it was extremely agile. So it took, you know, it took a lot of effort to get structure in place, the time to make the system well defined in order to get the best benefit out of it. And then um, their considerations are basically, you know, the traditional ones that you look at whenever you design any human experience. So the form factor, um, which we talked about is the wearable device. It, it snaps into a hard hat. It's sometimes people don't wear with hard hat, but primarily they do. Um, the interaction modality. So it's completely hands-free. It's all voice controlled. Um, the mental model. So what people expect when they put it on their head. Um, I, I imagine everyone's here familiar with that term. Um, the display capabilities and limitations. So in AR, you know, we're all, as Mark said, we're kind of inventing a new world here. So that the technology is also being invented in a new world. So when you are experimenting with the technology, there's things that it can do and things that it can't do, and you have to learn to work with those things and use them to your advantage. Um, and then, the, of course, the humans that are involved. So ours are industrial workers, and they have a lot of uh, specific needs and uh, experiences that we need to take into account. Um, I have a typo. Sorry about that. The skills gap. Um, so this is a really important thing in our field, in the industrial field, because what it does is it really divides your, your market from a target audience, target user perspective. So you have a group of humans who are older and a group of humans who are younger, and they have grown up in completely different experiences with technology. So you have to kind of address that and, and acknowledge it and work and use that as well to your advantage. And then our process and approach. So um, we did lots and lots of rapid prototyping. Um, the good thing about Realware's uh, agility was great for this. So 
because there was so much, there was such an agile mindset, the rapid prototyping was super valuable. And this is really important, I think, in AR because you're trying new things, right? And you need to try them. You need to put it on and see it actually working in order to understand if what you did is going to be beneficial and, and actually achieve the results you want to achieve. Um, collaborative design and engineering. So, Becky, Becky sorry. I, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's Mark. That yep. rapid prototyping, is is that doing it with actual users or is that doing it kind of internally? How did the, how did you get the feedback and who did you get the feedback from? So ours was primarily internal. I, I would have liked it to be more with users. Um, I think that that probably would have given us even more insight, um, but it was primarily internal. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Um, and then collaborative design and engineering, uh, that is a lot of times in companies, this is one of the really powerful things about design. A lot of times in companies, there's an isolation between design and engineering, or there's a design isn't as important in engineering, especially in engineering like companies. So it's really important that you, I think, give equal value to engineering and design so that you get the best result. Um, and again, the agile methodology, that's really important. I think that a lot of times designers sometimes resist this. I have for a lot of my career because you want things to be perfect before you hand them over to somebody. But what happens when you're agile and you work quickly is you learn a lot faster. It's kind of like the Silicon Valley mantra of fail fast, learn quick. Fail quick, learn fast, one of the two. Um, so I think that that can be very, very valuable in AR in particular. Um, and gamification. So gamification is kind of has um, proponents and opponents. And I'm a proponent of gamification. And what it is, a lot of people think that they don't like it because they think, oh, that means you're going to make a game. And it doesn't mean that at all. It mean it could if you wanted to. But what it means is that you use game-like psychology or interactions to encourage use and make things feel good. So basically you're trying to give a psychological benefit to a user by what they do in order to encourage them to do it or to make them uh, learn faster or to make them feel good about what they're doing or just to just to overall give a positive experience and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that use games out there so I think that um, and I think they're quite addictive <laughs> so I feel like that they have something they're on to something good <laughs> so I think that it's positive thing for us to try to leverage even in an industrial setting and then uh, material design. So our, our strategic approach was to say, okay, there's a company out there called Google and they have done a ton of stuff um, around a design system. They invested millions and millions of dollars. They had loads and loads of designers, thousands of hours spent designing, I think something like 40,000 icons. It's um, probably, you know, one of the most significant investments into a design system that's ever occurred in history. And so our our strategy was to leverage that and um, use the fact that millions of people are using Android devices. We should leverage that as well and, and integrate that into our system. Um, so I talked a little bit about this. These are just like direct slides from my internal presentation about the the design system, some high level stuff. So it just goes through some of the things I already said. So uh, material design, iconography and visual cues from Google material design to leverage familiarity and reduce cognitive load for learning the system. Uh, natural language visual cues. So we strategically designed some of the commands. So the, the way the real world device works is say what you see. So the commands are actually on the screen and you say what you see in order to control it. So the the idea was to visually make that feel like Google Assistant. So it would feel command based and also to differentiate the commands from Google Assistant by making them all caps. 
so that as we started to move toward natural language that you would see the differentiation between a control, a command control and natural language interaction. And then it has uh, color modes that are dark and light um, to optimize viewing for, especially for industrial environments, which can be quite extreme from minute to minute or day to day, depending on where they are. And then the interaction model, so let's command and control, say what you see. And then gestures. So in this version of the operating system, it was the first time that we integrated gestures. And they're only used, they're very strategically placed to only be used when the user is doing something focused. So when we know like pretty confidently that they're not trying to work at the same time, like they've stopped to do something, like connect to Wi-Fi or um, type in something, enter some sort of text or something like that. So the idea was to try to minimize gestures while they're working because they're using their hands to work. And then moving towards spatial computing. So the realware device is actually what's termed as assisted reality and it's move and it, and it has, it's kind of emerging between assisted and augmented. And so the idea is that you move, you get people comfortable with the fact that they have this basically what was called at the market launch, a floating tablet in their view, and then start to move them experientially toward um, XR and spatial awareness so that they kind of get comfortable with the fact that there's something that they're not touching and then they start to understand that it's now everywhere. Becky, so it's Mark again. Can you yep. talk a little bit about the gestures? I, I didn't know, I didn't realize there was kind of a gesture control. Uh, it's, uh, it's only head gestures. I'll show you in a minute. I'm going to show you in a minute. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. I'll, I'm going to show you some screens that explain it. So these are these are some examples of, of the system, basically the, the command, the design system. So they show like different types of controls that were integrated into the system. So people understood what was happening and they were used consistently across the entire system and all realware apps. So there were level controls. There were action. This was something called an action bar and there was something called a command bar. And these relate um, like in philosophy to uh, things that are on the Android OS, so you would get kind of a one-to-one -one understanding of what was happening when you use them. And then uh, this is the gesture integration. So basically we designed this head gesture um, that's used in a lot of different areas. It's used in the keyboard, it's used in file navigation. So what it is, is basically just panning your head left and right to navigate and then using voice to narrow down so like a uh, voice lets like narrows down the number of items that you see and your your head controls the left and right movement. And then there's a limitation. So like basically the number of items that you have is limited by the uh, angle of your head being limited 90 degrees. And then so these are some examples. OK, so. This is an example of uh, level control. This is the camera. This is the camera screen. So this is an example of level controls. These are status indicators that um, are taken from Android. This one's not from Android. We made it up because they didn't have one. Um, but these are Android standard camera iconography. Um, this is another level control, zoom level. Uh, this is a uh, the action bar and the command bar and buttons. So basically how this works is you have, these are your primary actions. So if you think about it in Android like tabs or little icons in iOS at the bottom of the screen, except they're words. And then this is an overflow menu. So like any, anything that a developer doesn't want in this bar or a designer doesn't want in this bar, it goes to this menu, which pops up when you say more options. And then this is an example of this exact system applied to WebEx Teams. So this is a WebEx Teams interface that we did with Cisco, and we just used the exact same style and interaction setup um, to, to design their, their uh, application. And then this is an example of it used in the keyboard. So this is a, this is a head panning back and forth on this, on the 
letters. And then this is control, voice control. And then here's another example. This is what's called um, my controls in in uh, on in WearHF. And what it does is it's just access to all of your quick controls. It's exactly the same concept as if you were to swipe down in Android and get their little quick controls. Same same concept. And then this is the, and this uses head panning and voice to activate. And then um, this is an example of the controls in the camera. So you have, it uses the same thing. It's voice control and head panning. And then this is uh, the file browser. So this is also head, pound, head panning and the items, the thumbnails get bigger as you, go, as you get into the middle of the screen. And then you can say the name of the, of the file. And then in real, in the WearHF realware system, there's um, a thing that I called WearHF indicators. So they're they're kind of like a accessibility feature that allows you to select items by number in case you know somebody's not going to say select SWAT dash AT da 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 or at at schematic. They might say that, but there could be an issue with voice recognition because that's kind of an odd word. So it allows you to select also by number. So you can just say select item four. Um, and then I did this, you know, the other day I was just in my garden and I live, um, I have a lot of lavender on my, I live on a farm and I have a lot of lavender. And um, so I was watching this bee, I was seeing photos of bees and it gave me a lot of thinking about AR in general because I was standing there with my camera, with my Nikon camera, and I'm looking through this tiny little square at this tiny little bee, and it's jumping around like I'm trying to focus on it, and it's and I'm manually with my hands, you know, manually focusing on it, and it's moving, you know, every so often it, you know, moves from flower to flower, and so I have to do it all over again. Right. And then so I thought, wow, that's fascinating. It's kind of like what humans are trying to do in AR. And I feel like that it's one of the things that if we can if we can understand experiences that relate to other experiences, it'll help us kind of develop AR in a way that makes sense for people. So I was thinking about this and then I thought, oh, yeah. And then somebody's going to focus on that with object recognition and all these, you know, technologies are going to co converge, right? So like IoT and AI and all this and all this information is going to come up and it's going to give me info about this B. And then I'm going to be able to say, OK, I want more info about this B or I'm going to be able to tag that B and then that B is going to fly away. But then every time I see that B, it'll know that that one's tagged. And I thought, wow, so all of that's happening in, in the human brain. What's happening in the human brain is identification of something understanding what that something is, acknowledging that, activating it, selecting it, reading about it, tagging it, and then it moving. So it's like it's like all of these things kind of happening in your brain. So I think that it just gave me this really kind of epiphany of like, wow, that's really fascinating to understand because a lot of times when you start using AR, you see kind of how um, there's a lot of objects going on and we get really excited about all the things you can do with it and you, there's things moving around and you can activate things and you can like get close to them and activate them and you can look at them and activate them or you can um, just voice control them or whatever. So it's a kind of a lot going on. And I think that if we think about it um, and, and then those objects are moving, we think about it, that's a lot what's a lot for the human brain to handle. So it's really important. I think it even even makes design systems and how we design even more important. So I thought I just thought that was an interesting example. Um, that's all I have for the presentation. Um, if you guys want to ask questions, I also have a, I also have this device here. If you want to just see anything in action, I can show you. But you're open to questions or whatever we want to do. Thanks, Becky. That was that was fantastic. Um, no worries. Yet yeah, open up questions, please. Feel free to ask any questions, so Becky. 
Hi, Becky. This is John Keyes. A uh, great, great presentation. Thank you so much. Hey, John. Um, Thanks. Yeah, hi. So I have a question for you. Um, did you produce any documentation or is Realware producing documentation that would enable um, third party software developers to um, develop applications that would conform to the design system that you created? And I guess along with those, along with that question, would there be any um, component libraries or any other software that would be made available to IS to uh, software vendors for that? Um, so I can't speak for the company, but I that was the goal. So the goal was to componentize it and then offer it. So and I there is documentation that was being produced, and I believe that is what is intended. I don't know the status of that or if the company is still going in that direction. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's good. I guess we could probably, you know, look online or, or talk to some of our contacts at Realware. So, but thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and you know, Realware are an area member, so, yeah, I'm sure a lot yeah. of you have contacts, but if you if you need any, please let me know. Yeah, and I can put you in contact if you want to talk to somebody specifically as well. I'm happy to do that. Perfect. Great, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Any other questions? Hey, Mickey, this okay. is Liz Junkie. I just want to say I really liked the B example. It was really cool. Oh, thanks. <laughs> cool. I like the B as well. That's great. <laughs> I felt like I should have, I felt like I should have animated it or something to make it feel more like that. But then I was like, okay, I'm going to go take a still photo of something that's already moving and then animate it as if it's moving. It's like, <laughs> seemed kind of silly. So I'm <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> uh, that's great. Thank you ever so much, Becky. I really appreciate it. And, you know, Becky's, you know, she's happy that we can share this wider, uh, the presentation wider and stuff like that. So obviously we'll yeah. make sure it gets around to the area members as well um you know and possibly some people will be in touch and stuff like that so thank you very much indeed that was just that was great no worries